Um, as I said, uh, my name is Peter. I am your host tonight for Berkshire Museum Trivia. We, this is a score at home trivia. Unfortunately, the software I have does not allow me to keep track of everyone's scores. I can only see what the collective whole answers. So if you get a couple questions wrong, don't worry about it. I'll never know. Uh, so we're going to get started. Tonight's theme is on the solar system and lizards. So, our very first question of the night. Uh, so, this weekend is the solstice. Uh, and with the solstice coming up, I uh, have the uh, famous Stonehenge here. Uh, on the summer solstice, the sun actually rises directly through a col uh, several columns in Stonehenge. Uh, the monument itself was erected. Uh, to line up with these uh, astrological events. So the solstice is the longest day of the year. It is associated with summer. Uh, and many ancient cultures actually built monuments, uh, studied the movements of the sun, and created their calendars around that. So you're able, they, they use these longest day of the year, shortest day of the year type events to map out the year in both uh, ceremonial purposes, but also for pr uh, practical stuff like when to plant, when uh, when's a good time for harvest, when do uh, hurricanes and monsoons typically come in. So these uh, events were not only ceremonial, they're really useful in figuring out, you know, day-to-day -day life uh, before, you know, the modern world and all of our calendars and Doppler radar and stuff like that. So there are two solstices and two equinoxes throughout the year. Uh, they're all associated with uh, a different season. Now, which season is the vernal equinox associated with? If you had to guess, the vernal equinox. What season is that associated with? Uh, I did not include summer because summer obviously has a solstice. But if you had to guess, is it vernal spring or fall or winter? All right. Most of you guys have your answers and we'll give a few more seconds on those answers. Now, I... Uh, Equinoxes are, of course, the time of year when it is the sun is at the equator. So if you're at the equator, it's equal day and night. Uh, and it's, you know, the most even balance between day and night uh, throughout the Earth. The uh, solstices are when it is at its most extreme, either the shortest day or the longest day. All right, we've got everyone's vote in. Now, most of you guys guessed the fall. Uh, which is a good guess. However, vernal is an archaic term for spring. So that the vernal equinox is the spring equinox. Uh, there's the winter solstice, the summer solstice, the, uh, and the vernal equinox just uses an archaic term for spring. So it's just an old-timey way to say spring. Now, in addition to solstices, this is a drawing from the 1800s of another astrological event. This is, of course, a total solar eclipse. Now, the Earth is actually pretty lucky that we get total solar eclipses. Uh, our moon, from, visible from Earth, is roughly the same size as the sun, visible from Earth. And so during these total solar eclipses, the, when the moon passes over the sun, it gives you this corona effect, that halo, where we can see all of the different branches uh, coming off of the sun. Um, and that is just pure happenstance that our moon is approximately the same size as the sun when viewed from Earth. So it allows us to get this really, really cool astrological effect. Now, there are partial eclipses where you'll get part of the moon passing over the sun. Uh, and those happen, uh, and uh, I believe one of those is coming up this year. But my question for you guys is, when is the next 
total solar eclipse visible in New England? If you had to guess when the next total solar eclipse visible in New England will be, will it be a year from now, four years from now, seven years from now, or nine years from now? I will tell you right now, April 8th is the date it will happen. So that one I, I'm going to give to you guys so you guys can plan around it. But what year is it? How much longer are you guys going to have to wait to see that total solar eclipse? Now, I will tell you right now, those of us here in Massachusetts and a bit southern and more southern New England will likely have to drive up to Vermont or Maine if you want to get the full effect of that solar eclipse. Uh, down here in southern New England, it'll be about uh, 90 to like 99 percent coverage. Uh, full coverage is going to be hitting the upper regions of New England, so northern Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. All righty. We got most of our answers in. So most of you guys went with uh, 2024, so not too long of a wait to go. And you guys are correct. So just four years from now, you guys will be able to put on your glasses because you still cannot stare directly at the sun even when it's behind the moon. And you will be able to see that total solar eclipse which gets me on to the topic of moons now here we have a lovely gyrating gif of our moon here on earth lovingly named the moon now throughout the solar system there are hundreds of moons around the different planets now the first two planets, Mercury and Venus, have no moons to speak of. And Mars's moons are tiny, likely asteroids that were caught in Mars's orbit. So moons can range from all sorts. Uh, on, moons can be of a wide variety of sizes. Now, we have a couple planets that have a lot of moons and some that have very few. My question for you guys is, which is the largest moon in the solar system? Now, are we here on Earth? Lucky enough to have the largest moon in the solar system? Is it Saturn's moon of Titan? Or is it one of the Jovian moons? And for those of you wondering, Jovian is the term for Jupiter. Uh, is it uh, one of Jupiter's moons, Io or Ganymede? So is it one of the Jovian moons, Io or Ganymede? Is it Saturn's moon of Titan? Or is it our moon here on Earth? And if anyone here has ever seen the uh, former sci-fi show, now turned uh, Amazon Prime show, uh, The Expanse, uh, a, a fairly significant plot point does happen on this particular moon. I don't know if that's going to be a huge hint to people, but it's a hint. Uh, all right, all votes are in. We're going to end our polling there. A lot of you guys guessed Titan. It is a really good guess. Titan is a huge moon. That is why it got the name Titan. Um, however, it is the moon of Ganymede, which is the largest moon in the solar system. So Jupiter has the largest moon. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. And our moon is the largest moon in relation to the planet that it orbits. So we, our moon is the largest moon compared to the planet. Uh, Titan is Saturn's largest moon. And Ganymede is not only Jupiter's largest moon, it is the largest moon in the solar system. It is pretty big. Alrighty. And since we have that Saturn-Jupiter competition, if you had to pick between one of these two, which one do you think has the most moons? So if you had to pick uh, and the most known moons. We're discovering moons all the time. So as of the year 2020, which one of these two planets 
has the most known moons. Uh, this might change next year, and someone discovers a whole bunch of moons around one of them. So as of 2020, does Saturn or Jupiter have the most known moons? And actually, if I jump back for a second, uh, I realize that in this photo of Jupiter, you can see two moons right there. We got one and two. And I thought that was, I thought that was, you know, it was kind of fun. I did not see any in my Jupiter photo. Now, our other gas giants have nowhere near the same number of moons uh, that we have discovered so far. Uh, so Uranus and Neptune, uh, Uranus has around 25-ish. Uh, don't quote me on that. And I believe Neptune has about 14 moons. So they have much fewer than either Saturn or Jupiter. All right, that's end of our polling there. Most of you guys guessed Jupiter, which is a really good guess. For the longest time, Jupiter actually did have the most known moons. However, in the past uh, couple of years, we have discovered many more moons around Saturn, and currently Saturn is our moon leader. So in addition to having its enormous rings, it also has the most known moons, I believe upwards of 80 plus moons now. Uh, Jupiter is not far behind. It has about 70 something-ish. Uh, so these planets have a ton of moons. We're discovering more all the time. And it's very likely that if there's another uh, exploration of Jupiter, that in the process they'll discover a, a number of more moons and that could cause this shift again. So as of, as of the current day, Saturn has the most known moons. Now we are gonna take things back to Earth. We have a lovely sunrise over the water. Now I know we're in the Berkshires right now. However, I grew up on the coast, so this is my thought of sunrise, and it's probably not everyone's, but uh, growing up on, you know, the Atlantic Ocean, I always picture the sun rising over water. Uh, so we have this sunrise. Since it is the solstice this Saturday, it is the longest day of the year. Uh, my question for you guys is, how many hours of sunlight does Massachusetts get on the summer solstice? It varies a little bit depending on where you are in the state, uh, but it's roughly the same amount. Uh, how many hours of sunlight are you guys gonna get on the longest day of the year? Is it 12 hours and 52 minutes of sunlight? Is it 13 hours and three minutes of sunlight? Is it 14 hours and 32 minutes of sunlight? Or is it a whopping 15 hours and 17 minutes of sunlight? So if you were to clock from when the sun rose in the morning to when it fell behind the horizon at night, how many hours of sunlight will you have gotten that day? And of course, depending on where you are in the world, the length of time of the summer solstice it varies a little bit. Uh, if you were up in the Arctic at this time, you would have 24 hours of sunlight and, and actually you would have days of sunlight because the sun would not set below the horizon for long stretches of time. And then of course the reverse is, uh, you have a much longer night in the winter. All right, we're gonna end our polling there. We were pretty split between 14 and a half hours and just over 15 hours. Now it is the longest day of the year, so you do get 15 hours and 17 minutes of sunlight to enjoy on the longest day of the year, but that does also mean you have a pretty short night. So if you struggle to sleep, when the sun is up, this is, this is going to be a tough night for you guys, uh, what with the really short night. Uh, the day after the longest day of the year is about two seconds shorter. So it, uh, that'll help you out if you feel there's too much sunlight. Uh, you'll have two seconds less the next day. All righty. 
That is all of our solar system questions. We are now moving on to our lizard questions. So to keep on, to keep on the solstice theme, this here is a day gecko. Uh, now, geckos are really, really interesting. They have, um, most species are able to climb vertical surfaces, some even able to go upside down. Now, they do this by having specialized uh, toe pads. They aren't suction cups. They aren't sticky. It is actually hundreds of tiny, tiny, tiny little hairs that allow them to grip a variety of different surfaces. And when I was looking this up, a bunch of articles and the Wikipedia and several other uh, scientific journals I looked at are all made it very clear that while they can stick to walls and wood and a variety of other things, they could not stick to Teflon. And that fact kept propping up. And that was, I felt a little bit interesting and in that they felt it was really necessary to say that geckos cannot stick to Teflon. Uh, now, on those uh, climbing feet, how many toes does a day gecko have? Do they have three toes, four toes, five toes, or six toes? If you were to count the toes of a gecko and they have the same number for front and back, how many toes do they have that they use to climb those vertical surfaces? Now, not every gecko is able to climb. There are several species which lack the toe pads. Notably is the leopard gecko, which uh, lives in the desert. Its feet have actually evolved to keep it propped up and away from the sand as a way to kind of control its temperature. So some of these... Uh, some geckos have slightly different feet structures. Uh, also, if you guys notice any weirdness in my uh, poll questions, uh, so what happened is I lost all of my polls right before the start and rushed to fix them all. Uh, so if you see an old question popping in, it is because I was uh, scrambling to turn some old polls into new polls because my, uh, the ones I had made had disappeared. Uh, all righty, we're going to end polling there. So most of you guys have thought eh, four toes on a, on a gecko, which is pretty common. A lot of lizards are four-toed. Uh, however, day geckos have a lovely five toes to help them climb all of those surfaces. Now, they're not set up like a human hand. They don't have a thumb structure. It is more three toes in the middle, two toes off to the side. So I'm trying to do something with my hands. Yeah, sort of like that. Uh, that was more complicated than I thought it would be. But yeah, so it's sort of two off to the side, three in the middle, and that helps them climb all of those different surfaces. Now, geckos also have a number of other really cool adaptations. Uh, now, you see here, this is a leopard gecko. Uh, now, if you look at his tail, you'll see that the texture and color is a little bit different than the texture and the color of the rest of its body. And that is because this leopard gecko is currently regrowing its tail, having lost it. So, uh, regrowing tails is something that a number of uh, lizard species are capable of. And not only are they able to regrow them, many lizard species are actually able to detach their tail as a defensive measure. This uh, is a way to you know, slow down a predator that might be trying to eat it. They'll drop their tail, the predator stops to eat the tail, and the lizard is able to make its escape. Now, sometimes the uh, lizard might circle back to where it dropped its tail uh, and eat that tail because it has a lot of nutrients that it would want to get back. Uh, for example, for geckos, they store a lot of the fat that they get from their food in their tails. So their tails might seem a little bit larger. That is because that is uh, where they store the, that fat for you know, the lean times when they're not able to find as much food. So my question for you guys is, which one of these reptiles, uh, these lizards, cannot regrow their tail if it's lost? 
So there's the green anole, the monitor lizard, the green iguana, or the five-lined skink. Now, for those of you wondering what those are, the green anole, if you've ever been down to like uh, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, or Florida, the green anoles are those little green li lizards you see running around all over the place. Uh, monitor lizards are really, really large. They're relatives of the Komodo dragon. They're just sort of a little bit smaller. Uh, green iguanas are, of course, uh, the famous, most common iguana. And the five-line skink is a skink that's native to uh, North America. They're extremely common. Uh, if you've ever gone hiking in, like, Virginia, you've probably seen a five-line skink basking in the sun. So if you had to guess, every lizard here is able to regrow its tail except for one. Now, there are some species of gecko which are unable to regrow their tail as well. I believe it is the crested gecko uh, that lacks that ability, which is seen in other gecko species. Uh, and so there's certain families where it's more common and certain families of lizards where it's less common. All right, we're going to wrap up voting there. That one, that one was a tough one for you guys. So... Most of you, uh, the top answer was the monitor lizard. You guys are correct. Monitor lizards cannot regrow their tail. Uh, now, green iguanas can grow their tail. However, it is a more complicated process. Uh, so depending on the damage, sometimes green iguanas are able to regrow the tail. Other times, they're not. Uh, but for green anoles and five-line skinks, it's relatively easy for them to regrow their tail. So uh, those... Uh, regrow a little bit easier. It's tougher for green iguanas, but it is still possible. However, monitor lizards, if, they're ta if they lose their tail, that is it. No more tail for that lizard. All righty. Our next question, the reason I'm showing you a quarter is because I want to get a sense of scale in your mind. Now, this is a very gecko-themed lizard show. So the two smallest lizard species are both geckos. Now, they share the title for smallest species, uh, lizard species because they are uh, about the same size. The difference between them is really negligible. Uh, they are found in the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, so they're both down in the Caribbean. They are tiny, tiny, tiny. They would fit entirely, if they stretched out, onto a quarter. So I wanted to get that image of a lizard that can fit onto a quarter into your mind for this next question. So how big in millimeters is the smallest lizard species? Is it 25 millimeters, 22 millimeters, 17 millimeters, or 13 millimeters. How tiny is the tiniest lizard? And these are also some of the smallest vertebrates in the world. So in addition to being the tiniest lizard, they are some of the tiniest vertebrates, so the tiniest species that actually has a bony skeleton in the entire world. So these guys are very, very small. They will fit entirely onto a quarter. Now, if you wanted to see them, uh, you would have to go book yourself a trip down to the Caribbean and you would have to search pretty hard. These guys are incredibly small. They hide really well in their environment. And one of them was only recently discovered about, I believe, 10 or so years ago because they are so difficult to find in their environment. So these guys are micro lizards. All righty. We got most of our answers in. Last chance to get your answer in before we find out. All right. Most of you guessed 17 millimeters. And you guys are... 100% correct. It is about 16 to 18 millimeters in length. Uh, it is the uh, Jaragua, 
Uh, dwarf gecko is the uh, smallest uh, reptile in the world. Well, the smallest uh, lizard in the world. I had a ruler, and I was going to show how tiny it was, but I can't find my ruler. Hmm. It's very, very small. So if you look at a quarter, it would stretch out from nose to tail and have room to spare on either end of that quarter. So they are a very, very small lizard. All right. Now, of course, this here is a sea turtle. It is not a lizard. Uh, turtles are their own branch of the reptile family. However, if you're going to the ocean, you're going to find a wide number of reptiles there. You have sea turtles, sea snakes, a number of different species, crocodiles, alligators, uh, that all live in salt water. However, swimming lizards are much rarer. So, my question for you guys, how many ocean swimming lizards are there? Are there zero? Is there only one species of ocean swimming lizards? Are there about six or are there 12? So, I want you guys to think about if you've ever heard of an ocean swimming lizard, they, again, unlike other members of the reptile group, lizards are much less likely to take to the water. So there's, while there's a number of sea turtle species and sea snake species and a number of saltwater crocodiles, there are very, are there zero or a handful of ocean swimming lizards? All right, just a few more seconds to make your guess. All right, we're going to end our voting there. The plurality has voted that there is only one. And you guys are correct. There is only one ocean swimming lizard. It is the, Galap the uh, iguanas that live in the Galapagos. Uh, the Galapagos Island iguana is the only lizard that uh, routinely and willfully swims in the ocean, uh, not as a means to escape a predator that's driven it out into the water. Uh, it actually chooses to, you know, go out into the water, swim around a bit, and come back. So it is the only ocean swimming lizard. All righty. Now, here in Massachusetts, we have a number of snake species. We have a number of turtle species. Uh, we do not have any members of the crocodilia family. But do we have any wild lizards in Massachusetts? This is a simple yes or no for question 10. Are there any wild lizards in Massachusetts? If you were to look around Massachusetts, would you find colonies of lizards living out in the wild. We have plenty that are pets. Do we have any out in the wild? All right, just a few more seconds on those answers, guys, and then we will find out. All righty. Well, it was a resounding yes that there are wild lizards in Massachusetts from you guys and... You guys are correct. There are, well, there's one. <laughs> uh, and this leads me to my surprise bonus question. Before I talk about that lizard, I want you guys to answer me one last question. Is this 
singular lizard that has been found living in the wi uh, living wild in Massachusetts, a native species, or is it something that has been introduced? So is is our one lizard that has been discovered in the wild a native species, or was it introduced? All right, a few more seconds on those answers. All righty, we got everyone in. A little less confident on this one, but the majority went for no. And you guys are correct. So the native, uh, there was a native lizard species that five lion skink I, meant, uh, I mentioned earlier used to be found in the south western corner of the Berkshires, but has not been seen there since the 1800s due to habitat loss. So the one native species we have is now considered extinct in the state. It can be found elsewhere, but has not been seen in Massachusetts for about a hundred plus years. Uh, now, recently in the past decade or so, we've started to see the Italian wall snake uh, in the suburbs around Boston. A few colonies uh, of the Italian, not wall snake, the Italian wall lizard has been found in the greater Boston area. So we do have a non-native lizard that appears to have taken up permanent residence in some areas around Boston. Now, if any of you guys are hiking and do see a five line skink in Massachusetts, uh, you might wanna tell um, the uh, Massachusetts Fish and Game because that species has not been seen in Massachusetts for a long time. And if we f discover that there is a breeding population back in Massachusetts, that's actually a really good sign that its habitat uh, has come back and the species is returning. So if you guys are ever hiking and find a five line skink in Massachusetts, uh, that's actually a really, really big deal. That species has been considered extinct in the state for a long time. All right, you guys, that was my final question of the night. Thank you so much, as always, for, ta uh, for taking part. Uh, it was great sharing the night with you guys. It will be a bit of a break before our next one. Our next, one, uh, our next trivia will be the first Tuesday of July, which is July 7th. The theme, uh, the theme will be marine mammals and American history. So hope you guys look forward to that. It'll be three weeks until I see you guys again. All right. I just want to say it was uh, a great trivia tonight, and I hope you all have a great night.